the interest for the interest of the participants and for making everyone informed about the academic achievement of both the speakers i take this privilege of uh, introducing these two speakers to all of you professor erin is a professor of law at delaware law school and the director of the global network for human rights and the environment she writes extensively and she has also written with the co panelist uh, here professor james on the area, on the issue of environmental constitutionalism including global environmental constitutionalism which got published in the year 2015 she has uh, written on the issue of implementing environmental constitutionalism in the year 2018 and she has authored encyclopedia of human rights and the environment indivisibility dignity legality geography and the you know in the year 2019 she has uh, edited the third edition of judicial handbook on environmental constitutionalism and compendium of cases which is used in un environment judicial workshop worldwide she is the executive director of dignity rights international which advances the human right to dignity throughout the world through education advocacy and consultation she is the author of dignity rights courts constitutions and the worth of human person with a foreword from very renowned personality in the area of legal education aaron barak a comparative analysis of global jurisprudence of the right to human dignity and the co-author of the first case book on dignity law global recognition cases and perspective again with professor you know may her first book reconciliation in divided societies finding common ground was of 2006 which was co-authored with south african scholar jeremy sarkin and with an introduction by agbishop desmond, uh, desmond tutu Uh, considered a transitional transformative justice after political upheaval she serves as the us national correspondent for the uh, center of international the draw comparative the environment and is a member of normandy chair for peace and the global pandemic network professor erin i welcome you in this uh, international summer winter school on critical perspectives on human rights and the environment now let me also take the pleasure of uh, in introducing professor james r a may who is a lawyer he is a distinguished professor of law founder of uh, global environmental rights institute and co-founder of dignity rights project at widner university and distinguished <coughs> excuse me a uh, distinguished visiting professor of law at sj quinney college of law university of utah <coughs> Professor May is the president and co-founder of uh, Dignity Rights International and a board member of uh, Normandy Chair for Peace, the Earth Law Center, the Lavare Green Watch. He serves as the special representative on Harmony with Nature for the International Council of Environmental Law, and the chairs the American Bar Association section on Environment, Energy, and Resources Task Force on Environmental Justice. He is an inductee of the American College of Environmental Lawyers, the Delaware. Valley Environmental Inn of Court, the National Judicial College, and Phi Kappa Phi. May has published widely in environmental human rights, including the Encyclopedia of Human Rights and the Environment, Environmental Rights, the Development of Standards in the year 2019. Then he has also co-edited that book, which I just now I mentioned, Judicial Handbook on Environmental Constitutionalism. <clears throat> Then uh, he has also authored the. you know uh, second edition he has edited in 2019 judicial handbook on environmental constitutionalism implementing environmental constitutionalism in 2018 the future of sustainable energy which he has done in 2016 uh, new frontiers in environmental constitutionalism again in the year 2016 environmental constitutionalism 2016 and uh, global environment constitutionalism in the year 2015 and he has also authored a work on principles of constitutional environmental law uh, in the year 2011 he has received numerous awards and recognitions including uh, from the sierra club american cano association and pace university hobbs school of law 
and Law Dragon as one of the world's most influential environmental lawyers. I welcome both of you in this session. And this session is uh, going to be on human rights, human dignity, and the environment. We know very well that uh, human rights are under threat because of environment, environmental degradation. And now, in order to advance the issue of environmental protection worldwide, a discussion is going on to how to establish the debate, how to make the argument in favor of constitutional perspective so that it can have a wider acceptability. So both these speakers, they are going to speak on this issue. Uh, both these speakers uh, will be Taking, the, uh, taking up the issues and they will be speaking one after another. So the, the presentation, the structure for this uh, session is like this. For around 40 minutes, both Professor Erin and Professor Jim will be making the presentation. And then uh, for around 25 minutes, uh, we will request the participants to go to the breakout rooms. Uh, and then I mean, uh, they can discuss the questions which uh, will be posed by the speakers. And then we can have a very intense interactive session wherein we can ask the participants to share their views in order to find out that what is the learning outcome of this session of the summer, summer school. With this, I invite uh, Professor Erin to make the presentation and share her thoughts on a very thought provoking area on human rights, human dignity, and the environment. Professor Erin, now the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Uday, for that wonderful introduction um, to these issues. And thank you again, Dina um, and Angela, for organizing the Summer and Winter School, um, the first annual Summer and Winter School of the GNHRE and UNEP. Uh, we're so excited to be a part of this. Um, and to talk to you about um, the relationship between human rights and the environment and human dignity and the way it's been recognized in law. Um, throughout the world. And the challenge for today is really to try to understand sort of what dignity, what focusing on dignity adds to the conversation. So we're going to, as, as Uday said, we're going to um, talk to you for a little bit about how dignity, what dignity means and how it's been recognized um, in law and particularly in environmental contexts. And then, yes, there will be a quiz because then we're going to go into breakout rooms and we're going to talk about some of the ideas that we are um, that we're going to be presenting. So, Jim, can you just forward the slides um, just so I can present um, an overview? And just to let you know, we are recording this session, as as you know, but when we go into the breakout rooms, we will no longer be recording and we won't be recording when we return from the breakout sessions because that part is really meant to be much more interactive and involved and get everybody engaged in the conversation. We wanna do it in a way that, um, that doesn't have to be made completely public. So the overview of this presentation is dignity, um, what it means and, and why it matters, human rights, how dignity relates to human rights thinking generally and rights-based approaches generally, and then how all this impacts the environment. Before we sort of begin, Jim, would I say some words of introduction? Uh, just, uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, just good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think you're in for a treat. Uh, Dignity plays such an important role uh, in life and in law. And that's what really we're talking about is the role of dignity as it pertains to environmental protection. It's not something that necessarily comes uh, to one intuitively or even to lawyers, uh, litigators, policymakers intentionally. Uh, it begins with this proposition, as Professor Daly mentioned, that everyone has equal and inherent worth. And you'll hear more about this in a moment, but um, I'll just finish the beginning here by uh, saying that the purpose of our presentation is to educate, but also to hear from you about the ways to use dignity under law to address uh, issues that, um, uh, that press the planet 
from uh, climate change to clean water. Thanks for joining us. So next slide. So first, a matter of definitions. There is no formal definition of dignity um, or of dignity rights. So we've taken, we've looked at the um, jurisprudence of dignity, which as we'll see later on in the presentation really spans the globe and spans all kinds of different um, aspects of the human experience. And we've, what we've noticed is that despite the diversity of cases, despite the diversity of factual situations that give rise to dignity claims, despite the diversity of courts and legal traditions in which dignity is being litigated, there's a, an enormous, really kind of surprising overlapping consensus about what dignity means in law. What, um, and, and so the definition that you see here on the screen is really sort of our composite of what we see in the cases. It starts with the idea that every member of the human family, that's language from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as we'll talk about in a moment, that every member of the human family has value, that one is born with an, with an inherent value, um, and that each person has a right to live as if his or her life matters, and has a right to expect from others that, that they be treated as a person. A second aspect of this is that everybody's worth is equal, right? And that sort of is, um, is explicit in the UDHR as we'll see, but it's also a matter of logic, right? Because if one person has more dignity than another, then that would allow that person to control another and then to completely demean their dignity. So it must be the case that every person's worth is equal to every other's. That means that as a matter of human dignity, we can't discriminate. We can't treat somebody's life as if it's more important or less important than someone else's life. Um, we have to treat everybody as if their value is equal. It's also important to understand that dignity is inherent or intrinsic. We are born with it. It's not given to us by law or by sovereign states or by um, by anything else, it's just what we get as a matter of birth. Connected to that is also its inalienability, right? That we have it from birth and we keep it with us throughout our lives, right? It cannot be taken away by law any more than it can be given or granted by law. And finally, it's universal or rather global. Every member of the human family possesses dignity, right? And that has uh, particular implications. Well, it has implications in two different ways as it relates to the environment, or at least two different ways as it relates to the environment. One is that one does not need to be a citizen or even a resident of any particular state in order to have dignity and have it be recognized, right? So people who are migrating, people who are going from one location to another, carry their dignity with them. Secondly, it transcends temporal boundaries as well. So if every person, every member of the human family has equal and inherent dignity, that would apply to every person who has ever lived, but it would also apply to any person who will ever live. So it brings with it this idea of intergenerational equity because members of future generations have the same claims to dignity that um, members of this generation do. Why it matters is that um, dignity is not just an attribute of the human condition or the human personality or a human being, but it matters in law. It's recognized in the International Bill of Rights. It's recognized in regional human rights treaties, including in their enforcement um, in Europe, throughout the Americas, in Africa in particular. And it's recognized in more than 160 constitutions around the world, which really means the vast, vast, vast majority of constitutions, plus in some countries where it's not mentioned specifically in the constitution, where courts have inferred it. 
So there are literally thousands of cases from around the world that, um, that revolve around the notion of human dignity and that it matters as a legal claim in law. This is just a very brief sort of summary of, of some of the ways that dignity has been described. Um, the American Bar Association in 2019 passed a resolution saying that affirming that dignity is the foundation of a just rule of law. We cannot have a just rule of law without recognizing human dignity. The Kenya constitution, um, as we'll see in a moment, we'll look at some constitutional texts, says that the very purpose of protecting human rights is to protect dignity. The European Court of Human Rights has said that even though the European Convention on Human Rights doesn't mention dignity, that dignity is nonetheless the essence of the convention. And recently, a few months ago, the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which is um, really visionary and um, very far ahead, both in matters of human rights and dignity rights on the one hand, and in the matters of environmental rights on the other, as we'll see, has called dignity the guardian angel of law. So just a brief overview of some of the ways in which we see dignity reflected. Jim. So dignity matters as a value, as a norm, and it also matters as a right. And again, this is the, the point that we'll underscore throughout this session is that dignity matters under law. There are real cases and real statutes and real constitutional provisions that are making a real difference in lives, including in, in environmental contexts. Uh, in, and this was recognized by uh, John Knox, the, the former uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. Uh, and if you're listening in and you're not looking at the screen, I'll just read it to you because uh, it's good stuff, which John wrote, human rights are grounded in respect for fundamental human attributes, such as dignity, equality, and liberty. So that's a goal. Um, and that sets up applications. So let's turn to dignity and human rights law. As Aaron mentioned, uh, dignity appears in international conventions. And it was there at the beginning of the United Nations, at the very beginning. So this is something that I didn't know when I started learning more about dignity under law. And I think is uh, interesting, maybe many of you know this, but the purpose of the United Nations in part is to advance human dignity expressly. That's what's in the UN Charter. So the, the forming uh, corporate document for the United Nations says that its purpose is to advance human dignity, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, it's also in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and we'll see language to that effect, and then throughout the canon of international law. We also see it in regional law, again, as Aaron mentioned, in a variety of instruments. And here's the point, again, if you're listening in, um, that dignity matters under law. There's a way to use dignity to advance outcomes under law, not simply uh, as a norm uh, or as a value of what could be or what should be, but what is. Erin? So what we'll do now is just run through a few slides, just showing you the language that's used um, in these various instruments um, to just give you a sense of how um, the international community first is thinking about the relationship between human dignity and law. So as Jim mentioned, the charter starts off with, of course, the charge of saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war, but also to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and in the dignity and worth of the human person. We see that three years later in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
the preamble which says, whereas the recognition of inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Just look at that language and look at the weight that dignity is bearing, right? It's the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. This is echoed in the ABA's recent uh, resolution that is the foundation of a just rule of law. And then in Article 1 of the UDHR, it gets more specific to just say specifically that every, um, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity, and then connecting that to rights. So this isn't just a statement about the nature of human beings. It's a statement about what gives us the right, as Hannah Arendt said, what gives us the right to have rights. The fact that we are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Um, and then connecting this to reason and conscience. We also see the language in the twin covenants um, on in, um, internet, uh, sorry, uh, on civil and political rights on the one hand and economic and social and cultural rights on the other hand, which really address very, very different kinds of rights. And yet their common source is that the rights in each covenant derived from the recognition of the inherent dignity um, and the inalienable rights of every person. And, and so 55 years ago, uh, there was agreement that there ought to be an international bill of rights of sorts, but disagreement as to whether the focus of it should be civil and political rights or socioeconomic and cultural rights or both. So the, this was the workout, right? The twin covenants, one about civil and political and the other about socioeconomic and cultural. And the two covenants, besides being called covenants, have very little in common. If you're a member of one, you're not a member of the other. Uh, and, there's, and that reflects sort of worldviews about what matters in life, right? And under different systems. But the one connecting thread, as Aaron mentioned, between these covenants uh, is human dignity. That was the one place of agreement. So okay. recently, um, the Human Rights Committee um, issued a general comment interpreting the right to life in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it was emphatic that the right to life is not just the right to live, but in fact, the right to live with dignity. It concerns the entitlement of individuals to be free from acts and omissions that are intended or may be expected to cause their unnatural premature death, as well as to enjoy a life with dignity. So it adds this qualitative dimension to the right to life. And we see this in much of the uh, constitutional jurisprudence that we'll talk about in a moment. We also see it at the regional level, as we mentioned. And again, this is just to provide you, it's a lot of words on the screen, but it's just to provide you uh, with a sense, both of the global breadth of um, the affirmation of human dignity as a foundation of human rights law. And also just to give you a sense of the language that is used. Um, and often it, it reinforces this language that we see in the international documents, the inherent and equal worth of every person. Jim? And then we see it uh, graduating, if you will, from the international realm to the regional realm, and then into the domestic realm. And in, uh, at least in some instances, this is where we saw it first in law uh, in the modern era. Uh, Mexico was the first country to constitutionalize dignity in 1917. So 104 years ago, uh, Germany uh, provides, if you will, sort of the state of the art provision that was adopted in 1949 in its basic law that human dignity shall be inviolable. And yes, I'm reading off the screen as you can too. And if you're listening in, uh, let me just repeat that. This is from a constitution. Human dignity shall be inviolable. So you may be wondering, what difference does that make in law? 
uh, we have a case uh, that we'll talk about, and well, to, to answer my own question, it makes a big difference, including addressing climate change. So recently, the Constitutional Court of Germany turned to this provision, not some other provision about uh, a healthy environment, which uh, the German constitution doesn't have or something else, but this provision uh, in addressing climate change. Uh, and we see the right to dignity in all, all sorts of other constitutions. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, it, it's been adopted in more than 160 constitutions. So uh, nearly something like 7 billion people on the planet live under constitutional systems that recognize, that recognize a right to dignity. Uh, the Brazilian provision ensures that everyone has a right uh, to dignity, for example. And then uh, other leading, if you will, constitutional provisions come from South Africa and Nepal and Peru. And the wording warrants repeating. Uh, just by way of example, I'll just read one of these. This, the, the provision from South Africa is that everyone has inherent dignity and the right to have their dignity respected and protected. And that's an enforceable right. It's enforceable in Nepal. It's enforceable in Peru. Uh, it's enforceable in Kenya, as Aaron mentioned earlier at the outset of the, the program, uh, in Belgium. And again, as we see a provision that uh, has been leading the way in addressing the human condition in Pakistan about education and access to justice and representation and criminal justice rights and a whole variety of matters. And here's the drum roll, a right to a healthy environment and climate change, but through the right to dignity and uh, Article 14 of the Pakistani constitution. Jim, could you go back to the previous slide for just a moment? Yeah, I just wanna draw attention to the provision from Peru uh, because I think this is so striking. The defense of the human person and respect for his dignity are the supreme purpose of the society and the state. Just think about that for a moment. It really reorients the notion of statehood and state sovereignty to, um, from something that is about the protection of statecraft to something that is about the protection of the human person. It just takes state sovereignty and kind of turns it on its head. And when we talk about environmentalism, human rights generally, but environmental rights in particular, we can think about that, that what is the purpose of state, um, state sovereignty? And what is the purpose of state power? Peru's answer to that is that the purpose of that is to promote and protect human dignity. So um, I'll just mention at the outset, just sort of by way of introduction to the next set of slides and the next issue that we want to talk about. The next issue that we want to talk about is how these constitutional provisions and to some extent the international and regional law provisions are, have been um, interpreted and applied in the specific context of cases, um, mostly in constitutional law around the world. There was a question that came up in the, in the chat and I thank you for that question and also just want to encourage others to, um, to use the chat space um, uh, uh, to, to engage. Um, but the question really had to do with, um, let me just, how, how dignity would figure in a twelve critique of international human rights law. And I, I wanna mention a couple of things about that. One is that what you should have seen already from the universal human rights, the regional human rights instruments, and also their constitutionalism in a really wide range of constitutions from around the world is that dignity, although it might have started off um, and it, it it started off in specific constitutions, as Jim mentioned, like in Mexico and in Germany and in other places, even pre-war. But the notion of dignity that we think about now is really underpinning all of human rights law, the way John Knox said. Um, that notion really comes to us from the foundational documents of sort of the post-World War II era, the, U the UDHR, the Bill of Rights. And so there's a critique about that, that dignity maybe like other aspects of that international law, 
sort of a product of Western hegemony, Western intellectual imperialism, Western values imposed on the rest of the world. And I think that our thinking about that is that when we see dignity not just coming to us from and being defined in international law terms, but being defined in domestic constitutions and domestic constitutionalism, we see that in fact, each country is giving, is accepting dignity and then giving dignity its own spin, its own interpretation. So what you'll see in the cases that we'll be talking about now, both in the non-environmental context and in the environmental context, is that each country, regardless of the cultural tradition that they come from, whether it's Catholic or secular or Muslim or Hindu or Jewish or anything else, regardless of the constitutional culture that they come from and the social culture that they come from, each country is sort of accepting this universal inherent uh, concept of equal dignity and applying it in its own way to its own cases. And I think that's a sort of a strong response to um, what might be that sort of toil critique. But I also wanna say as a substantive matter, when courts are taking dignity seriously, they are taking seriously this notion that every single human being alive and in future generations has equal value. And that is a very, very strong rebuke of all forms of discrimination and oppression and marginalization. It just, if you really commit to this idea as these courts are increasingly doing, there is no space for marginalization, for exclusion of voices or of experiences um, or of lives. So I, I would invite you to sort of look at the, case, at the constitutional text we've already seen, but especially at the cases that we're gonna be looking at in the rest of our presentation in that, in that context. Um, go on. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just a quick aside, Aaron, before we move on to the next slide, the question about rights of nature and harmony with nature, whether there's room for dignity uh, in that conversation. And Aaron and I uh, and others and Dina have written about that junction, but there's more work to be done there, more thought. Some courts are already bridging that uh, divide, if you will. <laughs> Uh, between dignity and nature. You see the predicate, the, the adjective is human dignity uh, in international law. But if nature has rights, then the idea is that dignity should extend and can extend to nature as well. And Aaron, before I go on to the next slide, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I want to add to that is a plug for the next session coming up after this one, which yeah. is about the rights of non-humans, specifically in that context, the rights of robots. But there is a conversation, um, both literally and conceptually, that Josh Gellers, um, the author of the book and the, and the instructor in the next session, um, and, and us have been having about the dignity implications of rights of nature and also rights of robots. So I think there's a lot more to be said there. Um, and again, just to be clear, sort of our focus has been on human dignity because we come to it from a human rights perspective, not, but that says absolutely nothing. We make no claim one way or the other in this context about the implications of dignity for non-human entities whether natural or, or otherwise. Go on, Jim. Okay, so we see dignity personified in law in various ways. One is regarding identity and personhood. And so some constitutions exemplify the idea that in sort of the bundle of dignity rights that everyone is entitled to be who they wanna be right, uh, that their personhood, their autonomy ought to be protected. And if you don't see the screen, if you're just listening in, the slide has sample provisions of constitutions that do just that. For example, the constitution of Italy that says 
that the protection of human dignity is based on the idea of the human being as a spiritual and moral being who is predisposed to freely define and to develop him or herself. So again, the, the, the uh, sort of the, the grand point of our session here in this, in this series is, to, is that this matters under law. So these are legal provisions that matter, uh, that are subject to enforcement and vindication and remedy. Um, and then there are additional provisions, uh, but Aaron, let me turn it back over to you before we move on to the next slide. No, go on, move on. So we see similar provisions in Germany uh, and, and elsewhere. So these are just examples. Uh, we also see the, uh, the next, if you will, pillar of dignity rights uh, regarding participation, uh, you know, political participation, voting, association, protests. And um, some constitutional systems protect that. And what we have on the screen is language from a case from the United States, uh, a famous case anyway, in First Amendment law, that uh, where the US Supreme Court wrote that, that no other approach other than protecting speech would comport with the premise of individual dignity, this idea that human beings have a voice and that voice matters because every voice is equal, it has worth um, and is inherent and universal. So, uh, so we see that uh, exhibited in jurisprudence. Aaron, anything on this before we move on? There are a number of cases that uh, from around the world that talk about uh, what it means to live with dignity sort of this idea that we talked about in, from the general comment. Um, and uh, one sort of famous case is from Germany, from the German Constitutional Court, interpreting that provision that Jim pointed out previously, um, that established that there is a guarantee that derives from Article 1.1, the, the assertion that human dignity is inviolable. Um, that guarantees what they call a subsistence minimum that is in line with human dignity. And that means more specifically that um, everybody is entitled to the physical existence of the individual, but more than that, uh, sorry, food, clothing, household good, goods, housing, heating, hygiene, and health. And also ensuring the possibility to maintain interhuman relationships and a minimum of participation. And so what we see here, and there are cases like this in India, in Latin America, that also try to sort of say, what does it mean to live with dignity? What must the state provide and ensure in order to make sure that every human being can live with dignity? And so if you just go back for a moment to the previous slide, um, that it's not just sort of the biological needs like food and, and water, but it's also the ability to live in, in comfort, housing, clothing, heating, et cetera, hygiene, health, but also the ability to maintain interhuman relationships. A part, an important part of dignity is to be able to live in society with others, not just because we are communal and interactive and interrelational beings, but also to ensure a minimum of participation, the ability to participate in community decision-making. And we see this in um, particularly described in very rich terms in the jurisprudence in Latin America, partly in terms of indigenous communities, but also in terms of um, just understanding human dignity in general. And so we see it here um, in a case about the Kothan, um, where the government failed to respect their role with respect to nature and the legacy of their ancestors and which violated their human dignity in their sacred spaces. This very sort of holistic view of human dignity, of what it means to live with dignity that is in a particular space, in a particular um, community. And that of course brings us to the cases that are specifically about dignity, human rights and the environment. Uh, so, the language on this first slide, and I'll just read it, uh, comes from 
the Supreme Court of Nepal about this association between dignity and the environment and says it better than, well, I at least ever could. It cannot be imagined to live with dignity in a polluted environment. And from there, the court engages the right to dignity and how environmental contamination breaches that right. Uh, so as Aaron mentioned, we have dignity that uh, derives from environmental values and undergirds uh, all sorts of um, aspects of environmental law at the international, regional, and domestic level. It goes all the way back to 1972 with the Stockholm Declaration, which declared that everybody has the right um, to an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity. So there it is, and, you know, that long ago in that um, super important declaration. And then we see dignity appearing in the sustainable development goals. Did you know that? I mean, the word dignity appears something like, I counted it once, <laughs> something like 11 times in the sustainable development goals. It's uh, besides the word poverty, it appears more than any other noun, any other, any other uh, operative word. And that's, it, that goes back to the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that, again, this is the purpose of the SDGs, to envision a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, and I'm quoting. And that the purpose of the SDGs, again, get this, is to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in a healthy environment, linking those attributes together. So dignity matters uh, to the United Nations and to the SDGs. And we, and, and we start to see how dignity matters in other contexts under law. Aaron, would you like to talk about this? Um, why don't you go ahead and talk about this case? And we see this most recently, just, just a couple of months ago. Uh, and well, I guess it's more than a couple now, but in March, time flies, uh, in a case from the Constitutional Court of Germany, interpreting Article One, which is the dignity provision of the German Constitution, uh, that the right to dignity shall be inviolable. And the court, uh, in, uh, uh, in an environmental case, uh, turns to that right to dignity. There isn't a right to a healthy environment in the German constitution or anything like it. And uh, here the court in essence says that the right to dignity includes a right to a healthy environment. It just uses different languages as a right to ecological minimum subsistence. And to me, that's a right to a healthy environment. So the point here again, is that we see courts turning to a right to dignity uh, in uh, in the protection and conservation of, uh, of the environment. Another example where we see uh, uh, the environment protected through a right to dignity is from a case uh, out of Nigeria. The, it's pronounced Bemri, but the, it's against Shell Petroleum. You know, it's a hugely important case about a hugely controversial and complex exercise of extracting petroleum from among the largest reserve in the world uh, in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta. And Shell flares off most of the methane gas uh, that, you know, during that operation, uh, they use the oil, but the, the gas is flared off. And so, uh, you, know, a couple, you know, a couple of decades ago, a farmer, brought a lawsuit arguing that that violated the right to dignity under the Nigerian constitution and won. Uh, the court ordered Shell to stop flaring, which Shell ignored <laughs> and the government didn't enforce, but still the court, uh, it was in the comfort zone of the court to, to rule that, um, that environmental degradation violates a right to human dignity. Aaron? So, this slide is here to show you, first of all, that dignity does um, obviously, I think it's obvious, um, have a relationship to water, to the need, to the human right to water, um, but also to show you that um, dignity claims don't always win. Um, and so there are claims where people say we need our right to water, 
um, as a matter of human dignity. And that's a, often a very, very compelling argument because of the um, many ways in which water contributes to and is necessary for the ability to live and the ability to live with dignity. And yet courts don't always impose on governments the affirmative obligations to make sure that water is available. And they sometimes don't even, as I think in this case, don't even hold governments responsible for things that they've done to violate that right to water. Nonetheless, I think it's a very important claim to make. Um, go ahead. So, um, and here is another very important claim to make or that's been made in Pakistan under the right to dignity. Uh, that's Article 14. So the Article 14 of the Pakistani constitution guarantees a right to dignity. It's enforceable, it's on par with other fundamental rights in the constitution of Pakistan. Pakistan doesn't have a right to a healthy environment in its constitution. So here we see in this case, and we'll talk more about uh, the judge who coined uh, the language that's on the screen, linking uh, uh, climate justice and water justice to the right to dignity. And that's in the Ashgar Lahari case, a case about climate change. So the court there was turning to a right to dignity to establish a climate change commission uh, to doing something that at the, at the time, you know, it still is pioneering and showing that the, the role of dignity in addressing uh, climate change and promoting climate justice, but it's, you know, it's complicated. Erin, uh, you wanna take this one? Yeah, and this also relates to a question that is um, that in the chat, that's in the chat, a great question. With increasing climate migration, how does human dignity play out for refugees and displaced peoples? Which state could be held responsible for maintaining the human dignity of non-citizens? Jimmy and I are in the process of producing a report about migration with dignity um, with the International Organization for Migration and the Environmental Law Institute, among others. Um, that addresses specifically that question. And the reason it's such an important question is that when people migrate, particularly across jurisdictional lines, they lose their rights, typically, but they don't lose their dignity. And so to the extent that dignity does imply rights and entails certain rights, they should always be able to claim a right to live with dignity from whatever country they happen to find themselves in um, that they claim is denying them a right to dignity. So this is a case that probably many of you are familiar with. It comes from New Zealand and then up to the UN Human Rights Committee, which ultimately, again, rejected the claim, but accepted the basic premise that climate change can violate the right to life, including the right to live with dignity, they just said that in that case, the evidence hadn't been asserted that the situation was so bad or so dire that the right to dignity was denied, but they left open the possibility that claims along those lines could be made in other circumstances. Um, and so what the, court, what the committee is saying here is that the conditions of life in such a country um, uh, uh, in this case, it was Kiribati, um, in such a country um, may become incompatible with the right to life with dignity. So again, interpreting the right to life, not just as being a protection against death, but as being a protection to live with dignity. And then more recently, um, uh, we see another case from Pakistan. Uh, another case from Justice Ali Mansur Shah writing for the court and here for the Supreme Court of Pakistan again just a couple of months ago, the D.G. Khan case, another uh, case uh, ultimately that involves climate change and kids and the court trying to figure out how to apply the right to dignity concerning access to information in other contexts. But the court points out that um, uh, the, the purpose of the Constitution is uh, to promote the right to life with dignity, echoing what Aaron just mentioned about what came out of the Human Rights Committee. And then um, lastly is we have this language. So this is the last slide and then we're going to uh, have a conversation breakout group um, about the role of dignity under law and what you do. Uh, and 
again, for those of you who are listening in, I'm just going to read a portion of this. So forgive me. Um, it's about dignity and intergenerational justice. And I'll, I'll, I'll read most of it. it. Again, this is from Justice Mansoor Ali Shah. And he, in, in this case, DG Khan, applying the right to dignity provision in the Pakistani constitution. Here goes, because he says it way better than I could. We learned from nature's 3.8 billion years of evolution. How is it that other species have learned to survive and thrive for 10,000 generations or more? Well, it's by taking care of the place that would take care of their offspring, by living within the ecosystem in which they are embedded, by knowing not to foul the nest and then skipping on. For our children and our children's children and all those yet to come, we must love our rivers and mountains and reconnect with this long and life-giving cycle of nature. And that's an interpretation of what dignity matters and how it matters across time and space. So we closed with that. So now I think we're headed into the, or Aaron, anything else you'd like to add to that before we, we head into the breakouts? No, go ahead. So, um, uh, so again, thank, thank you so much everybody for listening into all that. And now it's your turn. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. So what we wanted to do now in for about maybe 15 minutes is uh, put you into breakout rooms and ask you to think about the following. This is the part where we said, there is gonna be a quiz at the end, this is the quiz, but it won't be good, <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, but we, we know that you're all working on a whole bunch of really interesting issues. And part of what we're interested in is learning um, and inviting you to think about how dignity law might inform the work that you're doing. So the idea is to spend 15 minutes in a small group conversation um, context and invite you to talk about the work that you're doing and how dignity would inform any particular project that you're currently thinking about, whether it's a paper you're writing or litigation matter that you're involved in or a policy that you're involved in or whatever it is. But just to think about how this idea of human dignity and dignity rights um, might inform what you're doing. So we'll split you up into four groups, invite you to just have an open conversation, stop the recording so that this is really just intended to be a very open and, and, and congenial conversation. And then in about 15 minutes, we'll invite you back and then we'll spend the rest of the time talking about what we've, you know, sharing what you what you've been thinking about. So um, Dina, do you wanna go ahead and break us into groups?